do the sex. <laughs> Today's locker room talk topic is, did I just have an orgasm or climax? Uh, the difference between the two. So folks, I believe that the key to spectacular sex is understanding the difference between an orgasm and a climax, which is something I have only recently kind of discovered for myself. So I am no expert on this topic, but lucky for you and me, I have an expert here to teach us about the difference between the two and maybe help us achieve the two together separately, maybe? I don't know. That will be a question. And my guest today uh, should be familiar to you if you've been listening to this podcast for some time. My guest is Avery Dean Swift, a coach and facilitator specializing in somatic embodiment, trauma healing, and erotic liberation. Don't we all want to be erotically liberated? If you are here, I really hope that's what you want because that's what we're working on. Um, and you may be familiar with Avery Dean because in the past, they have been our guide through uh, erotic blueprints, the erotic blueprints. If you haven't listened to those episodes, there's two. You're going to want to go back and do it because it will improve your sex life. I'm confident. I am absolutely confident of that. And don't we all want to have a better sex life? We do. But Avery Dean, I would like you to take a moment to introduce yourself, reintroduce yourself to listeners and introduce yourself to my new listeners. Thanks, Annette. Um, I'm happy to be here again. It's nice to see you again. Uh, my name is Avery Dean Swift. I use they and them pronouns. Um, I live about an hour east of where Annette lives. I'm on the land of the Inchiwanapum in the in the Columbia River Gorge National Scenic Area. And uh, yeah, I'm a coach and a facilitator. I work with the erotic blueprints as well as a number of other tools focused on erotic liberation. Um, I'm a yoga therapist. I work with somatic embodiment and trauma healing as well. And it is my great pleasure and joy in life to help other people get out of pain and experience more pleasure. So I'm excited to be here today to talk about this topic of the difference between climax and orgasm, because most of us think of them as the same thing. They often come together. Ha ha ha. <laughs> and yet when we can learn to separate the two, we can actually have better experiences with both of them. And then when they do happen simultaneously. Whoosh, yeah. yeah, I'm excited to get into this. So we're going to dive in this morning. Avery Dean and I are having coffee and uh, water together. It is coffee time. Um, so that is what we're doing. We're talking about orgasms, climax, and all of it over coffee. Cheers. Be reading. Let's talk about sex. Okay. So let's just start at the beginning. What is the key point to the difference? If you can nail just one quick thing that would explain the difference between an orgasm and a climax. Go. Yeah. So climax is a physiological experience. It's a physiological peak and resolution. Orgasm is more like an energetic state of being that we can inhabit. And we can, it can be brief or it can actually last a really long time. So often those things happen together. We often think of them as the same thing, but a, a climax is like a genital sneeze. There's the build up, build up, build up, release. And sometimes there's two or three releases. And then there's kind of a, a softening of libido. There's a softening of arousal. There's softening of erections following a climax. And I bet you we've all had experiences of having a climax where we were like, wow, I just came, but it didn't actually feel that good. Yes. So this yes. is, uh, so the climax guys, and I had a, Back, I was talking to a friend about this last night. I was telling them that this was the interview I was doing, and I had it backwards. I think what you're saying is the climax is what we typically call the orgasm. It's that thing where it's coming, like I'm going to have an orgasm, and that's actually the climax. And an orgasm, it's like the orgasmic state. It's the state yes. of pleasure that surrounds that whole journey up to the climax yes. and, you know, 
then dissipates afterwards. Is that correct? Yes. So with the orgasmic state of being, it's, it's that, like you said, it's that sense of pleasure. It's the pleasure that we experience and it can come frequently, haha, it can come in an erotic encounter, but we also experience it in other ways. If you think about the most delicious bite of food you have ever had, we call that like a mouthgasm, right? <laughs> yes. We've had experiences where um, seeing a beautiful sunset maybe, or holding a loved one and having that heart expanding experience that feels like a heartgasm. We can experience that orgasmic state of being in so many different ways through so many different avenues. And it often is paired with climax. Frequently erotic and sexual climax is an orgasmic experience. And when we can learn to separate the two, we can experience more orgasm in life. We can have more access to orgasmic states of being. We can actually lengthen the amount of time in a sexual or erotic experience where we can play in that pleasurable orgasmic state before we get to the climax. Because often what happens is following a climax, then like we said before, libido kind of wanes. We go into a bit of a refractory period in our physiology where our genital, our, uh, our genital erections start to soften. The blood starts to flow out of our genitals. And sometimes there's less pleasure available following the climax. And we're often not that interested right. in more pleasure following a climax. We're more interested in a nap and a snack. Right. And so when, yeah, go ahead. I think some examples I want to give and I think especially to our cis male population that listens. Sometimes, often, I hear men bragging about, oh, I made her orgasm. She came. And they focus really on that. And oftentimes, vulva owners and women will be like, yeah, I came, but the sex sucked. And it's confusing to the cis males out there. They're like, but I made you kind. And they're so focused on that orgasm, which is actually the climax. And an orgasm can be very, a, a climax, which is what it is, can suck. It's like, yeah, I came, I twitched down there, but everything that was happening around it was awkward and yucky. And like, I wanted to get out of there as quickly yeah. as I could because it wasn't orgasmic. It wasn't, exactly. you never got to enjoy that state of eroticism and sexiness. And that is yeah. the sweet fucking stuff, right? Um, yeah. I mean, sometimes you just want to get the twitch down there and it relieves, it releases all those gr great little uh, hormones, the happy hormones. A little bit, but I think it's the state of eroticism or the orgasmic state. That's where you really get the good stuff. Yes. That is where good sex exists. And an example in my life where I get into the orgasmic state, but I don't climax and yet I'm completely fulfilled is sometimes um, with my partners, I like to get into that uh, – power play dom role where I'm just giving pleasure and directing the situation and I'm in control and I'm making my partner climax and mm -hmm. I'm in an orgasmic state. I never climax, but at the end of it, I am so fucking fulfilled and yes. I don't feel like I need to have the climax. I don't need the twitches. I don't need to physically, quote, come because I have gotten all the good stuff from being in that orgasmic erotic state. I it, Do you think that's, does that make sense? I hope that makes sense to listeners. Yes. And I love hearing you explain it from that perspective because it's so, it is so real. That orgasmic state of being for most of us is what's actually the most nourishing and pleasurable part. The climax can be really valuable because just like you said, it can bring a resolution to some of that arousal and all of that that gets kicked up in our system. It can bring it to a point of conclusion, a point that feels like a sense of completion. And for some people, 
hearkening back to the erotic blueprint stuff, anybody who remembers that, the sexual blueprint type, which is just one of the five, but that particular blueprint type really needs the climax. The climax is actually a really important and valuable part of their experience. The other four blueprint types are less in need of that physiological climax to have a really satisfying experience of pleasure. So just like you were describing, sometimes we can have these really orgasmic experiences where we can spend, I've, I mean, I've been able to spend hours oh, yeah. in that state of orgasmic pleasure where my body is pulsing with that orgasmic energy. And it's just continuation of pleasure that has a little, some peaks and valleys, but it's really like an emanation of pleasurable sensation that can move through our entire system. And for many people, that state of being, that kind of pleasure is extremely nourishing, extremely satisfying, and no climax is required to find that satisfaction. And that, again, is not to say that there aren't people who don't need that, because there are definitely people who need the climax to feel that sense of satisfaction, but not every person is like that. Not everybody's physiology needs that for that sense of completion. So this is where communication is really valuable, knowing our own way of being, which blueprint types, the erotic blueprint types are one way to understand that about ourselves. Um, but the more we know about ourselves and the way that we work and we can communicate that with our partners, then we don't need to be driven to a physiological climax if we've already experienced all of the satisfaction of orgasm that is really what makes us feel complete. Right. So to answer the question I was asked last night as I was trying to describe this to a friend, you can have a climax without an orgasm and an orgasm without a climax, correct? Yes, absolutely. Right. So to listeners, I want to recap this because sometimes, I'm, I mean, I'm still... I have had this knowledge for, I don't know, what, uh, six months, a year now, and I'm still, like, it takes a while to wrap your mind around it. But again, I believe it's the key to having really good next yeah. level sex. There's there's yes. okay sex, and there's sex that's like, yeah, that was fun. But then there's fucking mind-blowing sex, and this really is the key. So the climax is that thing when your vulva pussy twitches when your your cock explodes and lets all the stuff out that that is the climax <laughs> orgasm and i think for me the way to hold it in my head the best is to call it orgasmic state but the orgasm is that state of the sexiness, the sexy feels. It's all of the stuff that, you know, uh, when you first meet someone and you're starting to make out and there's that energy, we call it chemistry. We call it all sorts of the pheromones are released. This is how we speak about the orgasm, right? But it's that state that surrounds the whole experience. Mm -hmm. And creating that state and getting to that place it does not, it, sometimes it happens naturally, but especially I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, in, as a relationship, uh, you're in it longer, it can be often harder to create that orgasmic state to get to the orgasms. So, you know, we start looking at sex as, the, the, you know, we get together, we put our genitals together or yeah, we bang it out. You came, I came, high five. And then suddenly it's like you're talking to your friends in the locker room and you're like, oh my God, yes, we're having sex a lot, but it's like fucking not hitting right. And I'm like starting to want, you know, I miss the days of our really good sex, but you can't put your finger on why it's no longer good. Yeah. You know, I think many people do experience that in relationships that as there's more comfort, stability, and security, there's less of the chemistry. There's less of the spark. That spark when we meet someone new that we're connecting with and all the pheromones and all the anticipation and all the possibility, our whole system gets aroused with those things. And that's really where orgasmic energy comes in is when we're in a place of arousal, not just climactic, orgasmic, sexual arousal, but when our system is turned on, when all of our cells are turned on, 
And often early in a relationship, when things are sparky or we're in what's sometimes called that new relationship energy or NRE, NRE. we don't have to work very hard. We don't have to work sometimes at all to find that spark, to find that chemistry, to find that attraction. And over time, especially if the sex hasn't been that nourishing, that pleasurable, that can be sometimes a downward spiral where the more we have sex that's not very nourishing or pleasurable, the less nourishing and pleasurable the sex gets. And the less nourishing and pleasurable the sex gets, the less we want to have that sex. And the less we want to have sex, the less nourishing and pleasurable it gets. (laughs) Right. It's a downward spiral of sorts. Yeah. Yeah. And it can be an upward spiral as well. When we are navigating toward orgasmic pleasure for anybody involved in the scenario, no matter what the plumbing and the parts and the physiology is, when we can learn to really own our arousal, ask for what we want and need that actually feels arousing to us, be willing to be good and giving and game, as Dan Savage says, to offer our partners what they want and need and crave, to tap into those pleasurable experiences, then we can create an upward spiral where my pleasure feeds into your pleasure, which feeds back into my pleasure, which feeds back into your pleasure. And it could be an upward spiral into those really mind-blowing, perception-shattering, worldview-shifting, orgasmic, expansive, and transformational experiences where for at least a few minutes or maybe hours in that space, all is right with the world and everything is just one big, juicy yes. Yeah. So how do you know when you've entered the orgasm or the orgasmic state because like I was saying in my somewhat flawed explanation I think there is that like at first you're getting excited and the pheromones are going and you're feeling the chemistry you're making out petting like when does the orgasm begin and I think Mm. when it ends you're, you're gonna know but but when when do you switch from like oh this is uh chemistry this is exciting to like oh I'm in the orgasmic state So I would bet that a lot of different people would come up with different answers for like when that happens. But I think the best way I can uh, describe it is when our breath starts to quicken, when our body starts to heat up, um, when we start doing some of the kind of writhing or undulating in our body that isn't conscious, we're not intentionally trying to move in certain ways, Mm. but that energy starts to move our body in ways that are kind of beyond our conscious uh, attempts to move in any particular way. Those are all markers that we're getting, we're starting to tap into that orgasmic energy. And the thing with that orgasmic energy is that it can build and build and build and build and build and build and build. So we can tap into it at a, at a low degree where we're feeling it in kind of a, a subtle way. And we can also learn how to cultivate it and deepen it and make it bigger and broader and more vast, more deep, more high. There are many different ways we could describe, but really it just gets more and more expansive. And one of the ways we can build it into being more and more expansive is a practice called edging, which you've probably talked about, I would guess, on the podcast before maybe. A little bit, but I haven't gone deeply into it. And some people really don't uh, know what it is. But so yes, take, feel free to take a moment right. to talk about that. Yeah, let's take a moment and talk about that. Because edging can be a way to both make climaxes more pleasurable and more satisfying. And it also is a beautiful way to build into the expansiveness of that orgasmic state of being. So edging is a practice of coming close to the edge of climax, and then softening the stimulation so that you, we don't drop over the edge and actually go into climax. Right. So it's called edging because we go to the edge and then we soften a little bit. And then once that moment passes where we're no longer at the peak of climax, then we go back to whatever stimulation is, is working and that climax passes, but then the orgasmic energy can continue to build. So if we think of um, pleasure, like a, like a line going from low to high, like, like a graph, if we're looking at a graph of pleasure, right. as pleasure starts to increase at a certain point, we can have a climax and then pleasure goes down. 
if we get to that place where we could have a climax and don't have a climax, we might hit a little bit of a plateau state, but then that pleasure line can keep going up again until the next place where there's a potential climax. And if we climax there, then again, pleasure goes down. If we don't, if we edge again there, pull back just a little bit from the edge of that uh, climactic space, and then let the plateau happen and then continue with the pleasurable experience, we can keep building and building and building. And then we're spending a lot of time in that place where everything feels really pleasurable, but we're not on the edge of, or of climax. We are in orgasm. We are in an orgasmic experience, but we're not necessarily experiencing a climax. So what I want to talk to you about now, and I think this is what we touched on in one of our last conversations and I, it, that had been a new experience for me and how this subject of orgasm versus uh, climax came up. In my 365 days of orgasms challenge experience, I had a first experience and now many after of where and with a current my, my my current partner, something that I've learned and experienced. And this is like, I don't know that sex gets better than than being able to do this. I don't, I well, it probably does because I thought this before, right? But I'm also like, could a body take that kind of pleasure? What we have learned to do is obviously build the orgasmic state, build my level of pleasure and my partner's as well. And then, of course, hold it, hold it, hold it up to my climax, and then I climax, they climax, maybe at the same time, maybe different times. But instead of letting it drop, mm -hmm. we somehow have managed to keep my pleasure here, and mm. then it continues and can go up with continued, obviously, things, things are happening, even after I've had... Um, an orgasm. And then I stay at the top of whatever that pleasure is, even though I'm like, damn, I know the, the climax is over, but I am, mm -hmm. how the fuck am I still here? And sometimes wow. it increases. And I've had times where I'm like, how long can this actually go on? And then I have to stop thinking about it, right? Because then I'm like, is it going to yes. end? When does it going to end? And that's not what you want to think about when you are up here. And that is that experience is it's like insane it's it's I didn't even know a body could do that and then I can actually have additional climaxes that will happen or things that I'm like was that a climax I'm like does it even matter it doesn't even matter because I'm experiencing this thing um can, can you speak to that a little bit and I just feel like because I think one thing that especially when we look at cisgendered people um Cis men oftentimes, you know, they come, they shrink, and they're like, they're done, and want to roll over and go to sleep. And it leaves, I think, uh, cisgendered women, and I'm sure, again, I can only speak to that experience, because that's what I know, and that's what people talk to me about. And I'm sure this is across um, the gender spectrum. But I think it shows up very obviously in these traditional roles. Uh, it leaves a person feeling really kind of crappy when your partner's like, oh, my my equipment is like juiced and now I'm done. And that's the refractory period. And I also know that uh, people with vulvas experience that as well. In fact, I've really worked hard to avoid that refractory period because I hate that feeling like you're think you're getting really fucking dirty. You know, you're doing some dirty shit. And then the more you get into the orgasmic state, the dirty you get and you're like, I wouldn't do that normally, but I'm really feel I'm really turned on. I'm gonna do this extra dirty. And you wanna like DP fuck yeah. And then you come and you're like, oh my God, what <laughs> you know? And it's immediately after you have your orgasm or your climax. No one wants to feel shame two seconds after they they had an orgasm doing something really dirty. You wanna like stay in that orgasmic space and feel like the goddess you are for doing some dirty shit you didn't think you ever would, right? Um, but how, how do you teach your partner? How do you teach yourself to stay in that orgasmic space, even after the climax, even after you've gone limp, even after your clit's like done yeah. its thing? So, so. 
first thing I want to say is that different bodies do have different experiences with this. And just like you were saying, some bodies can have a climax and not have a significant refractory period and be able to maintain, sustain, or even grow pleasure capacity from that place. Um, and I've seen this happen with people with penises as well as people with vulvas. So it's not really a long, it doesn't really strictly fall into the boxes of biological sex. Um, and at the same time, like, again, different people will experience this differently. So right. to each person their own. And this is a place where practice and cultivation of capacity is what really makes us able to sustain those periods of pleasure and expansiveness longer and longer and longer and not be as subject to the physiological response of the body that often comes following a genital sneeze, a genital climax, where there is, just like you said, that refractory period where the erectile tissues start to lose their blood. And whether you have a vulva or a penis, everything can get erect <laughs> down in our genitals. Everything can fill with blood. And when it, everything's full of blood, there are many, many more nerve endings exposed on the surface of the skin. Many, many more nerve endings are awake. They're aroused, they're available for stimulation. And when that erection goes down, when the blood drains out of those tissues, out of the clitoris, out of the vulva, out of the penis, whatever we're working with, there's less pleasure available, literally less physical stimulation of those nerve endings available because with less blood in the tissues, there's less exposed nerve endings. Right. Any of us have probably had the experience touching our genitals when they're not erect does not feel the same as touching our genitals when they are erect. Right. And so there's some real physiology with this. And just like you said, some people can have that genital climax and still ex continue to stay in that orgasmic state and experience more pleasure. And there is an element of practice with that. And part of it is A, believing that we can. Part of it is recognizing that when we get into our head and start overthinking things that will pull us out of that moment, it will pull us out of that pleasure. So just like you were describing, if we start thinking about it, oh my gosh, how long can this last? What's happening right now? What does my partner think of this? What kind of fluids are coming out of my body right now? <laughs> you know, any of those kinds of getting into our head, thinking things will pull us out of the moment, will pull us out of that pleasure. Right. And so we can play with this. If we want to cultivate this, there are many ways to play with this in practice. One of the best is during a self-pleasure session, first edging, playing with edging and getting to really feel into the difference of when is a climax imminent? How do I pull back so that I don't go into climax before I actually choose to? Um, how do we build into higher and higher states of pleasure pre-climax? And then playing with what it feels like to be in that climactic moment without our brain then saying, oh, this means it's over. This means it's done. This means it's finished. Because when we tell that story in our mind, of course, our body's going to respond to that. And our whole system is going to feel into that as like, this is the end. It's over. It's complete. It's done. Right. And when we can let go of that story and literally be fully present to the pleasure we're experiencing letting go of the thoughts in the mind. Then we actually have the opportunity, the window, the opening to continue to maintain and build that orgasmic state of pleasure, that orgasmic state of being and like marinate and exist in orgasm for extended periods of time. Right. And just so y'all know, all of you listening out there, I just talked to my friend who was like, I just had sex for 16 hours nonstop. Mm -hmm. Now, anyone out there listening would be like, impossible, impossible. Because what I think most people think is like the, quote, banging. But what they really managed to do, they were, they're in NRE. <laughs> they're in the NRE state right now. Uh, it was to maintain that orgasmic state over the course of many hours. And that can look different ways. It can, I mean, being in that orgasmic state, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong or definitely uh, guide what I'm saying here. It doesn't even always consist of like 
touching each other's body in sexy ways. It can be like how you're talking to each other. It can be you can maintain that orgasmic state while you're laying together and then working into your next scenario. Am I, is that correct? Yes, absolutely. Even if you need to take a break for a snack, if like what you're eating or drinking is pleasurable to yeah. your senses, to your mouth, those can also contrib- contribute to orgasmic states of being. Right. And it's you bring this up and it makes me think back to, uh, I have just launched my uh, Locker Room Talk and Shots Triple X subscription uh, podcast episodes. And the first one was a man who wrote in to me about he's into male chastity, but not with a partner. He gets a cock cage and puts it on himself and then in, and then enjoys the eroticism of that. And something he said, you kind of triggered this memory, was that when he has the cock cage on, everything he looks at and sees, including he considers him straight, like, like the sounds of the body slapping, even the look of uh, the visualization of the cock in porn, because he, he watches porn while well, he has it on, is erotic, like is exciting to him. And he's like, and I'm straight. And that's because he is in the orgasmic mm-hmm. state and not allowing himself to come because he's got this cock cage on. Yeah. And to me, I was like, hey, first of all, that's fucking hot. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> hot to me when you are someone who identifies in a certain way, yet you get into the orgasmic state and you are able, able to appreciate the sexiness of everything yes. when you're in that state, how things look, how they feel, how they taste, how they smell, like yes. the world, the universe becomes sexy, right? Yes. Yes. As so many of us have probably experienced, there are things that when we are not aroused, don't sound that fun or pleasurable. They're not like, yeah, I don't really want to put that in my mouth or whatever. (laughs) But as soon as turn on is present, as soon as arousal is present, put all the things in my mouth. You know, things (laughs) shift when we are in that place of arousal, when we are in that place of being turned on. Yes. And really, that's what the orgasmic state is. It is a state of being turned on. Right. And again, we, this isn't limited to eroticism. This isn't limited to sexual turn on. It can happen in so many areas of life. Right. We can be turned on by something we see that's beautiful. We can be turned on by a bike ride. We can be turned on by so many different things in life. It's that feeling of being alive of having our system aroused, stimulated. In that place, the brush of a feather or fingertips across my back personally can send my whole body into shivering waves of orgasmic pleasure that are not centered in my genitals, but they move through my whole system. Yes. It is erotic, but it's not the same kind of eroticism that we think about with sex and genitals. Our eroticism, our sensuality, our sensuality is actually a lot more broad and vast than the simple act of thing A goes into slot B, we pump it a few times and then blast. That kind of sex can be so amazing and so fulfilling and so pleasurable. And it's also not the only kind of sex and turn on that can be so amazing and so pleasurable and so hot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that that is just the key to not limiting oneself. Let's say you're the kind of person that does just like, like, I want to make out with you for a minute. I want to put my thing in your thing and pump and be done. And that's exciting to me. That And, and I do think uh, there are all kinds of people who like that hot, like fast Absolutely. You know, I'm so into you and you shove me up against a wall and we just pound it out and then I ride that high. Wow. That is something that can happen. But I think that limiting yourself to that or thinking that's it really keeps you from experiencing levels of pleasure and, um, yeah, good sex that's out there. Yeah. You know? Because that is a kind of good sex. And that is a, again, like you said, it's a wonderful, pleasurable, really hot kind of sex that can happen. And 
there are other kinds of really pleasurable and really hot sex that can happen. Even somebody who that is the main kind of hot, pleasurable sex that they like, it is likely that they will have a partner or maybe other partners in life who are more fulfilled, more satisfied by a different kind of sex. And so being able to recognize this is what I really like and I do want this in my life and I want to build my capacity to also experience pleasure in multiple other ways so that I can also meet my partner where they are and make sure that my partner is having the kind of satisfying pleasure that they really want and need. Right. So for example, I could enjoy that kind of encounter. I am not going to climax during that encounter. There is almost zero chance that uh, even though I have had that experience many times where I'm just hot for someone, and this is someone of any gender, (laughs) any gender. I've had this happen with all kinds of people. And we come together for a hot second or like five, maybe hopefully 10, uh, do the stuff. And then, you know, for whatever reason, it's over with. I can be orgasmic and in the orgasmic state and be like, that was so fucking hot. That was so fucking fulfilling. I am not going to climax. There is no way my body is going to climax from that. I could not, that would not be good sex for me if it was what the only thing that I was being given all the time. Like I would be done. Like that would happen maybe five times. And then I'd be like, I think that we are not compatible. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You know? Because what your body really craves and wants for nourishing pleasure is something different than that. Yes. And my guess is when you're having the kind of pleasurable experiences that your body really craves, wants, and needs, that you feel really nourished and satisfied sexually, you can probably have some of those quickie, bang it out experiences and have a really wonderful time. But like you said, if that's the only sex you're having, then you're losing. If you don't have the other things that you want, that alone is going to get boring and not very appealing Right. In a short amount of time. Right. And and I also think that you may think that that's the kind of sex you want to be having. But until you learn the difference between climax and orgasm, and until you put the work in to be able to experience what is it like to be in orgasm for, mm, let's just start with maybe a half hour. <laughs> <laughs> something longer than five minutes and and you know then play with extending that then maybe if you allow yourself to uh, learn and experience that so you can bring it to the table for other partners you might be like oh fuck I really like this too this is also the kind of sex yeah. that I want to um, engage in unfortunately I've been thinking a lot about sex education in our society and culture. We aren't, it, and it's so unfortunate. We are, when we are taught sex education, we are taught how to make babies. That is it. We are taught the function of putting one body part into the other body part. We, you know, yes, we talk about a lot how we need to start teaching consent. That's important. But it is such a disservice that we do to everybody. We don't talk about pleasure. We don't talk about how to have sex that creates a fulfilling connection and a fulfilling life for people. And it is unfortunate. This is, everybody has to learn how to have good sex, you know? Yeah, there's, you're so right, Annette, that there is very little good sex education out there that gives any time or space to sex for pleasure. We talk about reproduction. We talk about making babies. Super important, right? These are things humans need to know about how our bodies work. Right. We talk about STIs. Right. And we talk about unplanned pregnancy. And we talk about some of the scarier bits. All of it. That's taught in a lot of sex ed programs. But we very seldom, in very few sex education programs, is there talk about consent, boundaries, what healthy relationships look like, what healthy conversations around these things look like, and what how we can uh, nourish ourselves through pleasurable sexual experiences in a healthy way that don't take us beyond whatever boundaries we want to have. Right. And I'm grateful to say that there is some sex ed out there that does do that. The curriculum that I have the honor to teach is called OWL or Our Whole Lives. It's a curriculum that was created back in the 70s because some folks realized that there wasn't enough good sex education out there, that it was mostly fear-based sex education. 
and it didn't include information about sexual identity. So this curriculum, Our Whole Lives, uh, it has four key values that are kind of the basis of all, everything that happens in the curriculum. And those values are personal responsibility, sexual health, uh, social justice and inclusivity, and self-worth. And those are all pretty near and dear to my heart as things that I think are really valuable to be learning about ourselves and how we move through the world. So I'm grateful that there is some really good sex ed out there, but it's not super widely available. Right, right. Well, I feel like we've done a fairly good job, I hope, listeners, of explaining the difference between orgasm and climax. If you have questions, please send them our way. You can email them to me at Annette, A-N-N-E-T-T-E, at sheexploreslife.com. I will reach back out to Avery Dean. We are willing to make sure you get the information that you need to have fulfilling sexual experiences. Why is this important? Why is pleasure and and having a fulfilling sex life, whether it's with yourself or someone else important? Because it is tied directly to your whole health. Experiencing pleasure, experiencing connection, healthy relationships, it is key to your whole health, mental, yes. physical, emotional, all of it. Taking time to nurture your sex life your skills as a lover, as a partner, so that you can have incredible sex. And trust me, some of you out there maybe have already had uh, the incredible orgasmic climactic experiences I have. I feel like I'm an average human. And since I'm only now tapping the level of pleasure that is out there for my body in the world of eroticism and sexuality, I have to imagine that the vast majority of us aren't getting to experience that. And after having experienced it myself, I'm like, I think everybody needs to do this. Everyone needs to have that experience where you are literally in that amazing orgasmic state for an extended period of time, just in pleasure and in the power of pleasure that is in your body that should not be taken from you, withheld from you. That's my belief. So yeah, I love the opportunities I have to literally just marinate in that pleasure because I fully believe that that state of orgasm, that orgasmic pleasurable state of being is actually incredibly healing for us. I think it helps us understand ourselves. It helps us release a lot of things. So in that place, tears can come up, laughter can come up, all kinds of things that can come up. And often we won't go to those orgasmic states if we're not feeling safe or comfortable enough to allow those things to arise, to allow tears to flow, to allow laughter to flow, to allow sound and movement to move through our bodies in ways that we are no longer in control of. It requires those really expansive orgasmic states of being literally require a little bit of a surrender and a letting go into whatever that state is. And that act of letting go, that act of surrender, of really being fully present to the pleasure we're experiencing is deeply healing to our bodies, to our hearts, to our minds, maybe even to our souls. And along with being healing, wouldn't you say it's also nourishing? Like- Absolutely. Abs- like truly nourishing. It's like it's like taking vitamins. It is. <laughs> right? It's maybe we should call it vitamin O, vitamin orgasm. Oh, I like that. <laughs> I like that. Uh I mean, I have often talked about all of the things that you your body starts producing collagen, like all of this shit that happens yeah. when you're experiencing yeah. that. And what a fucking yes. great way to take your vitamin, right? <laughs> I mean so um Take some time to think about what you've just learned about the difference between uh, the orgasm and the climax. If you have questions, send them my way. Uh, Also, you can go to YouTube. My YouTube channel is at, that's the handle, Annette Benedetti. You can watch this video uh, and see Avery Dean and myself talking. You can send that to your friends who all need to learn about that. Uh, Join me on my socials. Locker Room Talking Shots, 
Facebook, Instagram, Locker, Locker Room Talking Shots podcast on TikTok. Avery Dean, how can my listeners find you? I, uh, you can find me on social media at Embody Your Senses. And my website is www.embodyyoursenses.com. And I will, of course, put those links in the description of this video. In the description of this video, you're also going to find a way to check out Locker Room Talk and Shots Triple X, where I uh, share podcast episodes that maybe are a little too hot to talk about freely. <laughs> So scroll down and check that out too. Avery Dean, thank you for joining me again today for such an informative and fascinating conversation and I think helpful. And I look forward to it again. Can I leave one last tip for our listeners to practice with? Please do. To start really feeling into some of these more expansive states of even climax as well as orgasm, the next time you're in a self-pleasure experience, Notice if you're chasing the climax. Notice if you're trying to go get it and soften a bit. Let yourself relax and allow the climax to come to you. And see yes. how that feels. Also, on that note, if you're the partner of that person, don't keep saying, Are you almost there? Are you about to come? <laughs> It goes back to that concept because you're not allowing yeah, someone pressure to- pressure is not very helpful for many people. No. Some people love it. And if you love it, great. Do it. Go there. But if it's not your thing, it's not, it doesn't work very well. Yeah. The, the climax and the orgasm will instantly go away. <laughs> they might. They might run away very fast. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much. And we will be having more conversations soon. So tune in listeners and thank you for being here. So until next time. I'll see you in the locker room. Cheers. Uh, cheers. <laughs>